Welcome. It's great to see so many of you um, here this evening. So I will briefly um, introduce you and then pass on to you. So, you know, our lecture series this year um, entitled Between Hope and Despair, uh, we thought it was really fitting to, to have you talk as part of this because, you know, the fashion industry has been hit incredibly hard in the past 15 months, um, especially along the full human chain. And it's really fitting to, to talk to Ursula de Castro um, as you're such a strong critic of the current fashion industry and strong activist and, and change agent. Um, Ursula de Castro is a fashion designer, activist, educator and author. In 97, she founded the upcycling label From Somewhere and um, in 2006, co-founded the British Fashion Council pioneering initiative Aesthetica which she curated until 2014. It was around that time in 2013 that she co-founded Fashion Revolution, marking the Rana Plaza, the factory collapse in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And Fashion Revolution is now a global campaign in more than um, 60 countries. And in February of this year, she published her first book, Loved Clothes Last. And Really, I would say the landscape of fashion is, is much richer for her poignant, passionate, political and poetic interventions. So it's a real pleasure to welcome you here this evening, Ursula. Over oh to God. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. How am I going to live up to this? Um, OK, so I'm, I'm not sharing any slides because I'd much rather just talk to you. But if you have a phone, please take it out because I might send you places. Um, I know we've only got half an hour, but in fact, if you want to interrupt with questions, that's fine as well. But the first place I'd like you to look is on Instagram, the Fashion Revolution feed, which is at fash underscore rev. Find it in your time. You may be following it already, but it gives you a really good idea of what I do every day and the culmination of my you know, long career. Um, I'm interested always in speaking to students who want to change the fashion industry from within because each and every one of you will be choosing different paths. And in every single one of them, there is something that you can do. It's irrespective whether you choose to design or communicate or produce, whatever stay in a big brand, make your little venture, absorb from the very start that we need a drastic change. So my career started as a designer and that has very much informed everything I do. And I'm going to be really honest and I haven't entered this conversation when I started with any intention to find myself here right now. I wanted to make clothes. And I just so happen to love making clothes out of things that people didn't want, the brands didn't want, the productions didn't want. It got bigger and bigger and bigger, my little bubble of recuperating. But I was a witness to an industry that changed because I started doing this towards the end of the 90s. And I saw our own consumption and the consumption, the production of the industry drastically increase and change. I was a witness to when the Italian fashion industry radically moved to China. And I saw what we exported, this knowledge, and yet none of the dignity that we had in pockets. So everything has changed somehow since then. We are much more aware of this industry and what I try to do with Fashion Revolution and with the book that I've written is to influence people to really become a part of that change. The fashion industry is responsible for an enormous amount of damage. If we want to start with a historical uh, context, I would like to say that this industry, as we know it now, industrialized as it is, designed itself to be deliberately opaque and exploitative. So it's no rhetoric about let's go back to an industry that, no. This industry, like many industry, became a part of a system 
that was designed to exploit people and nature. And so what we are proposing is not a going back necessarily. It is definitely radically moving forward to places that we haven't seen. Now that is scary and frightening and dooming, but at the same time, when you're pioneering, you don't have frames of references. And so creativity can really be at the heart of everything. And right now, the solutions will come from creative thinking, whether that be design creative thinking, whether that be citizens creative thinking in the way that we interact with our clothes. But the reality is that we don't have the solutions. We don't have many solutions and we're still in the process of finding them. I would like you to look a little bit at fashion revolution, not, not necessarily now, but within your own time, to understand the breadth of, of what we try to communicate. We are a global movement with a presence in over 90 countries now, and we've just had our fashion revolution week, which is our eighth. Um, as Renate said, we, we, we started as a result of the Rana Plaza disaster, which I don't know whether you know, it was a huge collapse in which 1,138 people were killed, 90% of them young women, 2,500 people were injured. Not the first, not the last of these disasters could continue to um, occur in the fashion supply chain. That was the origin of fashion revolution. Eight years later, we can claim some successes in having influenced this industry towards change. We can claim that since we started talking about transparency and public disclosure, more and more brands are disclosing information about their supply chain. And what does that mean? That means that we are encouraging a culture of scrutiny where we want to keep brands accountable and ensure that their supply chain workers are fairly paid and that resources are not exploited. So going back to our eighth year of um, campaigning in this particular week, we campaign all year, and I can report that there have been incredible changes. The level of conversation, the topics that we are exploring are all bubbling up to the surface. We've been able to tackle issues such as plastic pollution, cultural appropriation, deforestation, hearing both from the experts and those unheard voices that I was saying before, those voices that are providing the alternatives or are witnessing um, the, the, the realities of this industry. I do stress you go and check our YouTube channel because you really will see the, the double prong approach, because as well as speaking with the experts and the unheard voices, we also supported the work of over 70 designers from all over the world and their small communities, their tiny supply chains, young emerging designers of clothes, designers of systems, but people that are making a change. This is our initiative, which is called Fashion Open Studio, which you can also find on Instagram at Fashion Open Studio, one long word. What does this bring us to? I mean, in my opinion, we have to look at the industry, the fashion industry, and not necessarily, and this is a point that I make very clearly throughout my book, I and we are not just chastising fast fashion, we are looking at the industry as a whole an industry that really has some very deep systemic problems that we need to address. And we need to address them before we can continue to evolve. And this is what COVID has done. It's been like another Rana Plaza where everything bubbles up to the surface and things are exposed and brands are put under intense scrutiny. How do they fare? What have we seen? We have seen the owners of the fashion brands making billions, and we have seen the workers of those fashion brands being owed billions. We are in the middle of a pandemic that it's directly related to the fashion industry in many ways, because we know that it is infringing boundaries that is creating an imbalance in nature. We know that these viruses thrive 
because we have invaded forests and mingled with animals where perhaps we shouldn't have. What's that got to do with fashion? Where do you think viscose comes from? Trees. So let's start making these connections. Where does our waste go? You know, these billions of clothes that we don't use. The fashion industry in 2015 was producing approximately 150 billion garments of clothing without including shoes and accessories per year. Can we estimate that it has increased by 2015? We know that clothing production has doubled since 2020. So we can assume that we're producing even more than that. Where does our waste go? To Sub-Saharan Africa and countries that we have already been culturally depleting for hundreds of years. So we are continuing to inflict a damage in the way that we produce and consume clothes. Now, for years, we've been hiding behind some really dangerous narratives if i can point one that's the one that says that fast fashion is so badly made that it doesn't warrant being ever mended and how dangerous is that when we're looking at overflowing landfills how useful is it to grow two generations um thinking that you just might as well throw the clothes that you've just bought for a fiver without even considering its effect before you bought it and your responsibility because you own it. And when you own something, you're in the fashion supply chain. That's a really dangerous narrative. Everything can be mended. Everything should be mended. The cheaper, the more it's our responsibility to make it last because it will have been made by people that were exploited and it will have been made with materials that exploited nature. You can bet on that. As for badly made, I'd call it simply made. Simply made means it's simple to repair. And whose responsibility is that? The brands who produce it. So we think about a future in which all fast fashion brands will also have cheap repairs available because we may be fortunate, we may be creative, we may be able to mend our own clothes, but society also needs to make those sustainable choices available to everyone and not just the privileged that can think that way or the creatives that want to think that way. Another really dangerous narrative has been around transparency and public disclosure. And this thing that I was saying, um, you know, the, the fashion industry hides behind a bubble of aspiration and aspiring products, and yet it thrives in a culture of secrecy. So transparency, which is potentially a technology, sorry, I'm just wondering, I'm still in time. Um, it's nevertheless also a very instinctive way to reach to the origin of the products that we buy. If we look at fashion history, um, this was normal. I mean, when I was growing up, nobody would ever have bought a pair of jeans that weren't made in the US or, um, you know, you had that sense of locality, that beautiful wool that came from Italy. We've lost all of these um, directions in a way, these journeys, since we've globalized the fashion industry. And this doesn't mean that we need to necessarily think exclusively local, but that we need to ensure that the fashion industry is accountable and that's the fashion industry at large, because what is luxury unless it is 100% traceable? I mean, luxury is all about the pedigree. So really, we should know where it comes from 100%. Um, in terms of where we are now and the, the, the book the, the, that I have written, um, my feeling is that it is a double pronged approach and everyone has a responsibility to interact. This is why I was saying that, particularly when I work with students, which I do, and young designers as well, um, what's important is that you identify your entry point in this conversation. It's not going to be possible, uh, apart from the really super zealous, to say, okay, I shall, you know, resolve these problems or come to these conclusions or, um, you know, move faster than, than, than how I can. What's important to me is accuracy and following your feelings, following your um, design signature, if that's what it is, 
or what really interests you. I say this because the whole thing is really, really scary. We are looking at an industry that needs an in immense radical change. And if you look at it from a visionary point of view, you can't stomach what you see. But if you look at it from small steps that you can make and how for you as an individual to reach and create your collective, because believe it or not, this is definitely about the collective more than it is about the individual, you'll start that journey. I've met so many people that got into sustainable fashion because they kind of wanted to save a fluffy rabbit. And then they realized that what they were solutionizing in terms of saving a rabbit was actually killing marine life. And they de deepened their conversation and started a journey. So each and every one of you will have something that matters to you, to you the most. For me, it was this kind of poetry of recuperating and it led me to become a worldwide campaigner on living wage, for instance, which was really not in, in my original plans. Um, I hope that you've got questions because um, I am actually, I enjoy the conversation more than just pretty much talking at myself um, in, uh, on my iPad. So maybe we try if there are a couple of questions now, and if not, I can continue. But if there are a couple of questions and I'm gonna look at the um, thing, let's give it five minutes and see if you guys are ready for that and want to ask questions. I would love to ask a question to start off the, the conversation. What made you decide to, to write a book, to, to design another conversation in a way? Well, weirdly enough, you know what, I look really confident and all that, but I'm not. And so I didn't think about writing a book at all. Somebody found me on Instagram and I never checked DMs. And this person DM'd me and said, you know, I'm from an agency. And I would like to write, um, to commission a book on mending. And I replied, I am really bad at mending. And there are so many brilliant books on mending already. I don't really think that I should duplicate. So I can't write you a how to mend, but I can write you a why to mend. And this is what the book is. It's the reason why we need to do it and then ways in which to do it but most of all people and how they do it but mending is intrinsic to humanity it's part of our creativity our manuality really part of this industry i'm sure that as soon as we started making we also started mending and so the book was you know uh, i had maybe just four months in which to write it and it's published by penguin so of course i definitely wanted to make that deadline but um i don't think i would have had the confidence to go to anyone and say hey by the way i want to write a book any questions or shall i just continue no questions right fair enough well, it I, have, helps. I have a question you got go 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 no okay i just wanted to ask a personal question about um, your professional life, just um, so you switched from being a designer to being an activist. And was that choice for you like necessary? And do you think we can be both? And um, yeah, how hard was that change to make? Okay, so it was necessary, but above all, it was really instinctual. I mean, I actually found that when I look at myself and my role as a designer, I was an upcycling designer and we had a small label, but we were very cult. We did things that people hadn't done before. We used large quantity of free consumer waste from the luxury industry in, in Italy. We were on all the celebrities in the late 90s from, you know, sex in the city. And we sold internationally in this very, very cool boutiques. But actually, when I look at myself, I don't think I was a really good designer. I was a really good transformer and I had loads of ideas, but as soon as I started having a little bit of relevance and as soon as like students from school started seeing the method that I had somehow pioneered and in many cases also invented, 
and they started coming into the studio um, as interns or you know for work experience I immediately included them in the design process and obviously credit them but I worked very much with a team I had something to say and my creativity became of service to what I had to say writing a book was really similar to making my clothes I was kind of writing a phrase and I could immediately see with my eye whether there was a hemline missing or if there was a word that was wonky. I don't quite know how to describe it, but you asked me a personal question, so I'm answering personally. But the reality is that for me, creativity is my vehicle. And without it, I wouldn't be at all a good campaigner. I'm good because I'm creative and I'm passionate. And this is what I somehow... Um, inflict <laughs> on others but anyway encourage in people um i don't remember numbers i'm completely dysnumeric dyspraxic you name it um, i'm not as accurate as so many of my esteemed colleagues in this industry i'm not really a deep down expert that does research but i'm a good activist um and i'm a better activist than i was a designer but i couldn't have been an activist unless I'd gone through the creative process first. So we can be both, um, or we can choose, we can do whatever we want. But what is important is that as a designer or as an activist, you focus on solving problems rather than creating them. That's the primary role of a designer is finding solutions. Thank you very much for the editor. A pleasure. So Anyone else? It sounds as though um, sort of you found a different path as a designer. Could you imagine going back um, to being a designer of clothes rather than of, of activism? Um, so I'm super, super lucky because my creative needs are met with others. I'm on, um, I regularly mentor students and very young designers or maybe students who then become emerging designers and some of them have become really successful over the years and this is my time, I give my time for this when I fall in love with a young brand or a designer and I really want to be a part of that journey. Um, I'm also, um, you know, one of these, again, lucky individuals. I'm on judging panels of all the best competitions. I sit on the panel for a new gen uh, for, with the British Fashion Council, with whom I still work with on that, um, you know, for, for menswear and women's wear. So um, I'm very um, surrounded by creativity. The thing is that I would never ever in a million squillion trillion years ever want to sell clothes again so for me stopping my brand and not having to think business but just think as laterally as i want to think that was a massive massive relief and i can't you know that's why for instance when i when i do mentor i say i'm not mentoring on business because it was a relief not to have to think that way what are you guys studying primarily? We have a mixture today between uh, fashion design students and fashion communication students. And there are a couple of questions in the chat which I'm going to relay to you. Um, okay. First of all, from Kulan, thanking, thank you for the interesting speech. I truly understand the reasons to love the clothes and take care of them. But what I wonder is, what does the work of a future designer look like? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a really brilliant question. And because this role is being um, reinvented by you, um, you know what the role of the past designer has been. It's been relentlessly creating new product which is born of marketing way more than it is born of, of, of mastery. Um, and we know that it's just as hard um, being an emerging designer because the mainstream has invaded in all ways, you know, in the ways that we can communicate ourselves. So the, the, the really the, 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 the role of designer is going through a transition, especially young designers. I can tell you something that happened to me recently that was really interesting. And I always give the speech for the first year at Central St. Martin's MA. And there's always around 54 students, 50 students. 
And um, last year, this was uh, out of pretty much all of them, except maybe two, uh, the majority of them didn't want to identify with becoming a Prada or an Yves Saint Laurent or working for those brands. And the most interesting conversation they had was with a designer called Richard Malone, another one right down on your phone, whatever check came out, Richard Malone. And they had considered him to be the leading light of their talks, conversations that they'd had that year. Now, Richard is, is like this tiny, he does bespoke clothing, um, recycles his own material, makes his own materials, um, and, you know, really, really tiny, bespoke, more like an artisan in a way. And yet he had been their, their reference point. So the role of the designer in the future, first of all, includes a different type of knowledge. Um, in the sense that you're going to have to speak with marine biologists, uh, with chemists, because the role of innovation in material is something that as a designer, you will need to go back to basic, go back to fabric. You know, you, the, the impact of using sustainable materials is huge, which isn't to say that those sustainable materials are now easy to find for students and young designers but they're incredibly easy to be discovered. And so the designer of the future sits down and when they do the research, they go inside their instincts and they think, you know, I want to reference Halston or I want to reference, you know, God knows what, but then there's another one that says, I want to check what these fabrics are made with. Do they contain toxic substances? Um, is this traditional cotton or organic cotton? This information, by the way, is fundamental for the designer of the future because you're not gonna be employable unless you demonstrate that you have this information. Sadly, it's not yet systemically part of the curriculum. So you, can't, you don't study the impact of materials and sustainable materials. So you slightly have to navigate it as a design feature, which it will be. It will be a design feature. It will be a design choice and you will design to include certain types of material, and you will inform yourself as to what those choices could be, even if they're not available to you right now, what they could be, that's the future. Um, I also think that the designer of the future is aware of their own impact and aware of their team. There's too many of us to celebrate the individual, and we need to change the structure of the fashion industry, which is 100% a pyramid. We need to go somewhere sort of a bit more flatty and undulating because it's, if we only look at the top, we are never going to look at the bottom. And your supply chains as designers are more important than you, frankly. I mean, you may have the mastery and the genius, but these people have the toil. They make your work possible. They make your expression possible. They will make your business possible. They merit your full attention and they merit the full attention of your customers because they are just as important. So you're going to start tiny. So it starts with the people next to you and then you continue, but you, you flatten and undulate rather than, you know, um, worship the, the hero at the top. Another question? This is fun. Yes, from Sana. I would love to know the scope of what legislation exists now to support mandating a living wage for garment workers. I know the circle in the UK is working on a bill to push for living wage. There must be many challenges to create legislation in one part of the world to regulate labour on another side. Yes, it is incredibly challenging. And I am the creative director at Fashion Revolution, so potentially my language is not really as policy as you would want it to be. But if you do go on Fashion Revolution, the website, you will see that we published a white paper quite recently. There's one that was like four or five years old and one that was published in 2020. And on that white paper, you will have this information spelled down and written down by our policy director. But by a way of telling everybody the bit that I know, um, it is incredibly difficult. Several organizations are working on a living wage. We are actually starting to campaign for a project on the living wage, which will, um, it's, it's a pan-European project and it's aimed at gathering one million signature which will be 
proof of you know uh, citizens engagement and they will be presented to the european parliament because there is an appetite in order to legislate around due diligence in france we already do have the law of due diligence i mean obviously zero zilch in the uk uh, france is beginning to really move in that direction again one is around due diligence and another law that they passed recently is around waste and burning so we are beginning to see um you know uh, levels of change and response from the government and i actually do believe that this year of covid has um, really increased awareness and participation. There were a couple of campaigns, such as the Pay Up campaign from Remake and the Pay Your Worker campaign from the Clean Clothes campaign that really um, highlighted the kind of the pressure and the urgency. So I do believe that legislation that will, you know, will be passed, um, you know, in the future, in the near future, for sure. Thank you. There's a, another comment from um, Zana also. She says, I, I love this um, Fashion Revolution Weeks. Who made my fabric campaign? Brilliant. I wish I could join the camera. Thank you for your time. Maybe you could say something about the, the decision to move from or to include not just the who made my clothes, but who made my fabric campaign. So Who Made My Clothes campaign is our first campaign. And believe it or not, the hashtag was used millions of times. I mean, it was really impactful. And what it was for us, it was, let's just ask a question that looks so bloody simple, but we know that no one can reply. In, in all honesty, we knew that brands couldn't reply. We didn't think it was that tragic, but it really, really was. And over the years, obviously, Fashion Revolution started with um, a call to transparency. So uh, a very social focus to, to our campaigning. And Who Made My Clothes gave um, birth spontaneously to I Made Your Clothes. And then the community of makers joined in and they started saying, I made my clothes. And, um, and so it, it's been this kind of constant uh, continuation. When we entered the, um, the kind of environmental side, we did so via waste and a collaboration with Greenpeace. And then we started using the hashtag loved clothes last, which is also the title of my book. And it was on my very first press release of when I had my brand because it described my, my method of working as a designer. And, um, and then we went to what's in my clothes, which is an incredibly important question to ask because it highlights the fact that the industry is not regulated and we don't know the ingredients of our clothes. And this then led to us demanding for transparency beyond tier one. Tier one is the manufacturing and tier two is the wet processes, the millers, the ginners, the spinners, the fabric makers. And we know that we have a certain level of transparency around the manufacturing, but actually who made my fabric, it's extremely, extremely difficult to know. So progressively, as we go further down the supply chain towards the very origin of everything, it becomes more complicated to um, visualize, to see, to scrutinize, but above all, it becomes more and more toxic from a chemical and environmental point of view as well as social, because obviously you mix the two when you have, you know, pretty um, dreadful working standards and dangerous working standards. And again, this is, you know, we go back to the designer of the future. Is that what you want to manage? Is that the origin of what you want? Do you call that luxury? Is that love? You know, it's not, it's a material that has a profound impact on people and planet and our responsibility to try and use them as little as possible and when we do to communicate to our customers exactly what they contain and how to manage those those toxic i mean you know we, we know with polyester that each time we wash a garment of polyester we release a 700 million particles of plastic so as designers we also want to mitigate um the washing of that product by maybe designing it as an overcoat and that thinking going on and on and on in everything we do with the fabrics that we use. 
Thank you. There's a question from Leon who says certain structures and fashion are existing for many decades and fatal damage has been done. How long do you think will it take to achieve change and call this industry sustainable? Well, interesting uh, when you say call this industry sustainable, because one of the things I always say is that I refuse to call it sustainable fashion and fashion. I call it unsustainable fashion and fashion, meaning I start from the principle that that, you know, fashion should be just. Um, I also um, another thing for you to do um, later or even now, um, if you go on our website, which is www.fashionrevolution.org and you check out our manifesto, I think it's slash manifesto, it's written in the present tense for this reason, because, you know, we, it's not about what fashion should be, it's really about what fashion is and, and the rest is unsustainable. It's impossible to know how long it will take, but unfortunately, it's very possible to know that it is incredibly urgent. And you know, that's what I was saying, you know, don't almost don't look too far because it's very scary, but we need to act with impetus because the time frame we've been adapting so far has been pathetic. And I've been at every single conference on sustainable fashion on the planet for the last 12 years. And people go, they congratulate themselves on that small innovation that they're planning on making. Never ever mention all of the mistakes from which we could potentially be growing from. And we are at plateau. Um, there are horrendous inst inst instances of, of greenwashing from brands, really unclear information being conveyed, inaccurate as well as unclear. And um, the time frame is up to us. So of course, I would like to say that it will happen soon. I actually think that after COVID, there's going to be a real call from governments to buy, buy, buy more, you know, restart, kickstart the economy. Um, so I, I don't think we're out of the woods, but I do think that the level of awareness that has been raised this year, the last you know 18 months since COVID started really, um, will be a spring. And I certainly have seen my own eco chamber become much bigger and maybe involving other eco chambers that weren't present before. But I am not uh, optimistic when I think at the, at the speed of the, at which the industry is moving. They're not investing financially as they should. And again, we go back to the wrong narrative. For years, there's been this narrative that eventually it will make business sense to be sustainable. Sustainability is a business opportunity. Too late for that now. Sustainability is a moral obligation, which is a really slightly different way of seeing things. Do I'm beginning to see, do you think there's an the ideal age for starting these conversations? I've noticed here. Yeah, ah, really interesting question. Okay, so yes. Um, they need to start as young as possible, but what's happening right now, and I don't know if any of you are on TikTok, but if you are, go and check the community of DIY and MIY, make it yourself. So these are kids who, after being brought up with this horrendous narrative that you might as well buy something and throw it away because you could never be seen on Instagram wearing something twice, have developed the brain clogs to say okay brilliant I'm gonna sell it on because I'm going to have to buy something new inevitably and I won't have the money so the resale is endemic amongst teenagers I'm also the mother the mother of four children of which two are teens well one of them is a teenager one no, no longer only just and what's super interesting is to see as I said the community of of, of tiktokers mending customizing um, DIYing, the aesthetic of fashion is absolutely moving in that direction. So we have designers that fake upcycling, but you know, some of the designers, uh, one designer 
a couple of designers I mentored in the UK, Bethany Williams and Priya Aluwalia, um, both are very successful and have uh, a super upcycled aesthetic while also upcycling. So, you know, to a certain extent, uh, the, the, the kids, when they will understand the sustainable impact of this act that they're doing quite instinctively, quite spontaneously, they will have the aesthetic that goes with it, um, it which is really, really interesting. The teenagers, as a result of, um, I don't know whether you remember a couple of years ago, all those initiative Friday for Future, um, Greta Thunberg, so many kids went vegan, understanding that the impact of what they eat is not just for their health, but the health of the planet. It hasn't quite dropped that clothes share a similar supply chain, in fact, longer, that our skin is the second most absorbent organ in the body apart, of, you know, apart from the stomach, that everything we wash and wear um, the chemicals we absorb and then push into public streams. So I believe that when they make that connection, then what they are doing spontaneously will become a much more political act. And when it comes to what you were saying, when is early enough to learn, what is more important is not when is early enough to learn, but for you guys and for everybody to pass the message on to as many people as possible, because old people that may have forgotten what it was like may reminisce and remember and decide to go back or um, you know everyone really needs to be involved in this conversation because there is so much that we can do on an individual level in all in, in everything that we do can i ask you about um just shipping in there um, uh, about education because I, you know, looking at your book, which is which is really timely now. I was thinking that you know about 60, 70 years ago, it wouldn't have had, it wouldn't have been necessary because um, people passed on skills of mending. Um, mending was taught at schools, so it's this is really an educational uh, project in a way that you're undertaking here, and also the question of what kind of education do you think is is needed in supporting these transformations? Well, it, it, it's true that you know that th these are wisdoms that we had, and we need to also analyze um, why we dropped them. You know, and, and to a certain extent, I completely understand why women in the 60s burned their bras and just stopped bloody knitting, you know, or sewing. We've been domesticized by these domestic arts, um, you know, and, and there was there was a rejection to them. Um, so it's not just that they became less necessary. The whole of society moved towards disposability and so-called empowerment of women. And so, you know, <laughs> all of this amazing long heritage was somehow um, buried. The story is really, really different. Actually, the, the textile industry, which is the realm of the female, is the industry that has innovated the most from the very beginning. Just you think what it would have been like to be a woman, you know, in prehistory or ancient times, only with the sense of your smell, to be able to identify that, say, cow pee would be a fixative for your red dye that came from the flowers in your garden. I mean, that is real intelligence. That's real innovation. That's real experimentation. The majority of, I mean, even the computer is linked to innovation in the loom, in the way that we use the loom. So everything we used somehow, when we used our intellect, it was closely linked to this industry. So this is a pioneering industry that at some point got hijacked by the capitalist system that we've been, um, you know, and this, as I said, it's hundreds and hundreds of years that we've not seen this, you know, more localized industry. Look at the story of hemp. Hemp was, you know, native and autochthonous to, to everywhere and it's been eradicated for what reason? So lots has been taken away in order to introduce, you know, new, new systems but the reality is that we can connect with those um, early instincts and of course it is about education if not anything re-education
but in order to re-educate, we have to invent new parameters, make it not the, the you know, a, a female, but an inclusive way of thinking, you know, thinking longevity over the things that we own goes hand in hand with our culture. We have entire art movements recuperating stuff picked up from the streets at the Pavera. We have, um, you know, Kintsuji, which was broken China, mended with gold to emphasize the breakages. We have quilting in, in uh, the West and we have Baro in, um, in Japan. So all of our comfort, look at any kind of trendy eatery, restaurant these days, it's got mismatch plates and looks like it's been, you know, the furniture has been picked up, picked up in, in a local depot. We take comfort in the aesthetic of things that are old. So we can easily relearn what we've been untaught. But I wanted to reply to, there was a question about a young, uh, about how, to make a decent living from selling clothes. And I don't have good news. It's bloody difficult. It takes um, a massive commitment. And that's why I say you need a team. You need a team of people that are as invested in doing something together because it's no longer just about taking your product to a little boutique. There is so much more that goes around being noticed and um, you know, selling your clothes and make a living out of your brand. The majority of the designers that I have mentored, um, and this is globally, because I mentor you know, globally, don't survive just by selling their clothes. They survive by making collaborations with others, designing for others, consulting. So there's a whole world, creating systems, finding parallel ways, selling clothes and selling clothes repairs. Um, so, you know, selling their fabric that they weren't using before. So there's so many different ways that we can interact with this commerce. But again, it also involves the systemic change of a system, you know, while we have something like 40 mainstream brands controlling 95% of the market, you guys are squashed. Um, and what we need is the concept of replicating rather than upscaling. So I think that this is one of the biggest changes that we will see over the next few years. Again, also COVID helped. People are looking for more localized. There are it, we, we're seeing people really being more curious um, around how fashion is being made. But that should always be your story. And this goes for the communicators in here. Um, people want to know and need to know how fashion is being made. That'll be a strength, um, both in terms of selling your clothes and how people will appreciate them. And in terms of how you communicate your story, because this is what your customers will want. What's interesting is that here I am talking to designers, I do this a lot, young students, who's talking to your customers? Who's teaching the kids that are your age or younger than you, who tomorrow will be in a position to buy you how to find you and how to recognize your difference? Who's teaching them? So education on all level of society, because we can't teach one if we're not also teaching the other. And, you know, we're all teachers and learners all the time throughout life. It's, it's always a, a, you know, you go from being one to the other. Thank you. There's a question, oh, there's a hand raised. <laughs> um, so what I realize is that um, there's always manipulation happening under capitalism and it just feels like that's really inevitable, regardless of the origin of the idea that it came from. So like, um, for example, like sustainable fashion actually came from like, um, because I mean, yeah, that happened because it wanted to go against exploitation and like manipulation uh, by capitalism. But then um, I guess, capitalism also kind of took control over it and um yeah so manipulation also happened <laughs> that way and um 
do you think it's actually possible to participate in the industry as a designer to destroy the system rather than like interacting with it? It's it's possible to do pretty much whatever you want right now. I mean, you know, it's again, um, I talk to a lot of young designers that, as I said, the majority of them will want to start their own brand. I also have to be honest, you know, the majority of the university I teach in London or I lecture in London are very expensive. So it's also only to be assumed that the students there who can afford to go to that university potentially are um, in themselves quite privileged. So the concept of investing or starting their own brand is something that, you know, they can mature in their head. But the reality is very different, for instance, for some of the young brands or students that I mentor in India or in China or in, you know, in, in Brazil, for instance, or South America. But the truth is that whether you have the opportunity to start your brand or whether you're going to have to be employed by a brand, you can be powerful in that position. You can be patient in that position because nothing is going to be, this is why, I mean, I'm really bored of the word, people really describe me as a disruptor and I've been a disruptor, but I have now graduated. I wanna be known as a constructor because I feel the system's being destructed already it's horrendous i mean it's it's a system of exploitation i want to construct a new one that's better so think that way think that you are constructing something and i'm often contacted by young designers that sit in really big brands in as junior designer or um, you know in the fabric department and they they come to me and they say look i want to leave because this brand really doesn't match with my principles. And, you know, I always ask them to really question that very deeply because how big is their impact outside versus their impact inside? You have to be pretty lucky to make a brand and be successful and sell it and become well known and win the competitions and get the, you know, the money, win the prizes, you know, that's, it's, it's elitist in itself by what it needs to be. And the ones that have the maturity to do it when they're very young, um, either it's very, very few, or they themselves are exploited by a system that makes them the latest amazing cherry pie and then shoop, sweeps them off the carpet when somebody else comes along. So the idea that somebody enters a brand for decent work that will pay you monthly money, which you need in order to be sustainable yourself, and that you can slowly, within that brand, influence what you know the other people around you and there are ways of doing it you feel lonely because brands are designed the same way as their supply chain the bigger they are the less connected they are between departments that often don't know sourcing they don't know marketing who don't know um you know buying who don't know cutting and so on and so forth make those connections that's what we're telling brands to do with their supply chain make those connections go meet those people go and exchange your views, find those others in that environment that share them, take it one step further, go out for dinner, get drunk, come up with amazing solutions that you never dreamt possible, keep them for yourself, and you will be promoted. When you're promoted, you will be in a position to recruit people. Who are you going to recruit? Someone that thinks like you, someone that thinks laterally, someone that wants to make those connections someone that wants to explore the things that are wrong because they're interested in putting them right. And then in a few years time, you'll be promoted again. And then you will have your team and you will decide what fabrics are being used for that label and what's happening in that country, which is why you will refuse to produce in those factories and so on. So that's what I was saying. This ain't no diet. This is a commitment that we need to make for our life in whatever industry we choose to enter, you might come out of here and decide, guess what? I never want to do fashion again. Whether you do homework or dentistry, you still have to think in terms of using your creativity as a service to get us all in a, in a position to, to get out of this mess. The, the, 
I, I write something in my book, which is what I believe. I told you at the very beginning, I'm not an expert, really. I'm not numerical. I'm not this, I'm not that. I'm really enthusiastic. And when I speak to people, and this has been all my life, or when I wear my clothes, people want to do what I do because they think it's interesting. So this is what needs to happen. If you do what you do with a sense of commitment and your own creativity and having a laugh along the way, because you do need to have a laugh along the way when you start this journey, people will come to you and will want to follow you and you will make those friendships and your circle will enlarge. You've got your collective, you're powerful. Thank you. <laughs> Did you also see that, the, um, think that the, the potential in a way of, of studying fashion is, um, is not just about you know, becoming a designer, working individually, but but being equipped with the skills to problem solve and being yes. equipped with the skills to to design systems to design interactions to design activism as in your case completely and i think that um you know that the fashion of the future is not necessarily clothes um but you'll find that you know people that study fashion tend to be quite fashion obsessed and um but there are so many other things that can be done. I was recently exposed to virtual fashion, which is basically going to be bloody huge in the future. And it is literally, you know, you see me and then whoops, I'm like dressed with whoever I want to be wearing. And, you know, I'll be wearing a, an amazing crown or whatever. And, you know, either change every five seconds, every five minutes, no fabric, no making, no supply chain, no nothing. Man, I'll buy every single one of them when they come out. So, you know, you're a designer, but you don't necessarily have to use fabric as your medium. So I, I believe that designing systems such as designing, deciding that you're only going to be recuperating. There's a brand that, you know, many, many young upcycling brands are only reusing clothes that are already in existence. There's a brand in India called Grandma Would Approve, who have two systems for their label. One is reconstruction and the other one is exclusively restoration, meaning that they only repair, but they repair with their own design signature clothes that are given to them by people who own them. And then they also butcher clothes a la typical, you know, secondhand clothes upcycling, they have the dealer, blah, blah, but the restoration is actually the more successful part of their business and what keeps their business alive. And it's 1000% their design signature, except they're not really designing, they're just intervening. So in that sense, I think that the teaching of fashion is about solving problems, but we also have to teach what the problems are that we need to solve. And you know that to a certain extent is often what is missing. Uh, grandma would approve again on Instagram as I say grandma would approve what would I give to be the type of person that can just share screen do 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 do, do and put it on the on the chat but that would take me half an hour and I'd be silent sorry thank you there's a question here from Tizia I feel like especially big brands are sticking very much to their way of selling and consuming and even if they do some sustainable collection they don't really want to change that I was wondering how sustainable fashion can even work in this global context, and maybe we have to let go of this concept completely. Um, yeah, the brands are not investing enough, and the, the greenwashing is a massive issue, uh, because as I said, the information is coming out inaccurate and uncomparable. And citizens and, and you know, people that would want to be informed find it actually really difficult to get to information. Um, but I really very much believe that people, and this includes anyone that wears clothes, so last time I counted it was very close to 100% of the population, but also you, because you are not just clothes makers your clothes wearers as well so whatever you think in terms of design you also need to think about the stuff you've got and your own buying habits so the only way to stir these enormous brands is by confronting them precisely where it hurts and that's on product and by no means do i mean to boycott because boycotting is one already accounted for in their profit and loss accounting. Two, 
um, it's obviously damaging towards the people who make our clothes, who should not be denied product, but should be made to make less product that's better made and better paid. So boycotting to slow down fast fashion really is not a solution. But when you yourself don't make your own clothes and you buy them, think what you think. And you think, buy a pair of jeans. Do they make my bum look small? Are they low waist or high rise? Are they skinny or flared? What kind of blue do I want? Dark blue, faded blue. So you have a whole bunch of criteria when you shop, change that criteria. So when you shop, you think, okay, does it make my bum look small? How is it in terms of actually paying a decent wage to the people who make these jeans? And then you go in another section of the brand website, which is called Code of Conduct. And you start searching and you see if they give you the kind of information that you consider to be understandable, reliable and convincing. If they don't, you might want to choose another brand. Same with the blue. What constitutes the perfect blue? It's not how electric it is. It's not how pigmented it is. It is whether it contains toxic dyes such as azo dyes, which will continue to be released in the water, not for one, not for two, not for three, but for many more washes, and that you will wear on your skin because you may have chosen to get the skinny ones, in which case you will sweat in them and your skin will eat those materials. So, and whenever a brand doesn't satisfy you, you go to their website and you say, I didn't find the product that I was looking for. Your product is not good enough for me because your product may fit my size, but it sure don't fit my principles. Now, you imagine if you all start doing this tomorrow and then somehow a whole bunch of other people start doing this tomorrow. 10,000 people did this on our website when we asked them to send an email to brands to ask them to pay their supply chain workers 10,000. That's a big pain in the neck when it comes to brands. They notice. So if we want to stop this system, we need to physically use ourselves as an obstacle. And that means designing different in your designer hat and living differently in your citizen life. There's a question that ties on really well to that from life. I personally think that a big problem of today's world is the deconnection between people, that we don't feel directly the consequences of our actions. Do you think globalization is something that can ever be in peace with ethical and sustainable consumption production? Mm, um, so it has to, because if we go back to rampant localism and nationalism, it means we're in trouble. Um, because the reality is that we've moved towards this globalization and we are now responsible, in particular us from Europe and the US, we're now responsible for what has been done historically. So that means in my case and in the case of my book, repairing my clothes and repairing the damage that has been done. That can only happen with action, and that action needs to be consistent, sincere, and committed. But the reality is that the great, uh, for me, in, in what happened during COVID was the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter. And I can promise you that my job became much easier when it comes to speaking with young people after that, because we've been saying that the fashion industry is exploitative um, and racist for years but it didn't bubble up to the surface. It's now very, very clear. Um, I mentioned before about you know, the waste, that we distribute our waste to those countries that we've been already culturally depleting for hundreds of years. So the, the, the reality is that we need to make a big, profound change. I mean, I'm a raging feminist, it just so happens because I feel that my side of humanity has been considered inferior, a mistake 
less for millennia and millennia, irrespectively of where we were, women just have. And I see the struggle to redress that imbalance, and I see the struggle to redress those imbalances in all life. I mean, global or local, what we need to do is to treat each other as equals. That's a massive innovation that doesn't require any technology. But the reality is that that's what we need to strive towards. And we've gotten together, we're seeing each other more than ever. I don't understand when, you know, now of all times, when we see each other's humanity, we are still picking on the differences um, rather than seeing ultimately that we're just all people with two feet on the same planet sharing the same sky. But, um, you know, I know it's really utopistic and odd to think like this, but I, I've come to believe that you can dream because 20 years ago it would have been impossible to even have this conversation, impossible to talk about waste, impossible to talk about supply chains beyond tier one. Half the stuff I've done 20 years ago was just not the accord. Yeah, the accord is expiring on the 31st of May. Exactly. So that's activation. So it's not really what I think. That's it completely irrelevant what I think about the accord. This is what the policy people do. This is what they tell us. And we know who we need to listen to. So what I think is that I know who I want to hear. I don't want to hear the people at the top of the brands telling us why the accord has or hasn't worked. Because there's always, always a difference of opinion. What I want to hear is from the garment workers. And the garment workers in Bangladesh are sing, in all of them, there's not, are all demanding, begging for the accord to be renewed. So it's completely unimportant what I think. And if you become politicized a little bit after this talk, and if you want to check about Rana Plaza, Bangladesh, if there is anything you can support right now on your social media, that would be that the accord is, is carried on. Thank you for asking these questions. It makes me um, know that you're very well informed yourself. So obviously you've already done um, a, lot of, a lot of the work. So co I congratulate you on that. Osla, thank you so much. We've already gone over our time, but thank you so much for sharing your, your politics, your passion, your poetry with us and showing us how to deconstruct and how to construct. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you all for joining and for your questions and for your answers. Thank you for inviting me. It's been fun. I really enjoyed it. I've loved your questions and I wish you all the best of luck and keep following Fashion Open Studio because you never know, you might be in there tomorrow and we'll see each other again.